so far in regarding all the RNA viruses that are causing disease, and again, the most common one that causes disease, we've taken a look at the positive sense, single-stranded RNA that don't have an envelope. We've got our positive sense, single-stranded RNA that do have an envelope. And that's about as far as we've got. Now, there is one more group that does have positive sense single-stranded RNA and is enveloped, just like the viruses in this yellow group over here. The biggest difference between this group and this little green area is that they also contain an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. What that means is that these bacteria are able to do reverse transcription. Normal transcription is taking double-stranded DNA and making single-stranded RNA, messenger RNA. Well, these viruses can take a single strand of RNA and reverse it and turn it into double-stranded DNA. That's a very unique enzyme, and it's, they're very unique viruses. The group are called retroviridae, and that's because the word retro means to go back or backwards, and they do transcription in reverse. Now, in their genetic material, they do have two identical strands of their positive sense, single-stranded RNA. And again, they can transcribe or make DNA from RNA using reverse transcriptase. So they're going to make DNA from RNA. That's going backwards. How they do that, they take their single-stranded RNA, so there's the red single strand, using this enzyme, that reverse transcriptase enzyme, that enzyme will start to lay down and start to make a copy of this positive sense single-stranded RNA, but instead of bringing in RNA nucleotides, A's, U's, C's, and G's, it brings in DNA nucleotides, so the A's, T's, C's, and G's. And so now we have this purple strand, which is DNA. Again, it's only one strand. It's the negative side of the strand, but it's only single-stranded. So that enzyme then goes back through and makes the copy. It uses that template, the negative strand, to make the opposite, the positive strand. So if there was an A on this strand, it would bring in a T. If there was a C, it would bring in a G. Till ultimately it's left with now you have double-stranded DNA that originated from that single-stranded RNA. The viruses that are in this group cause one of two main issues. They're either cancer-causing or they're immunosuppressive. So our first group are the cancer-causing, the oncogenic retroviruses. One of the first main ones is human T lymphotrophic virus. It's a mouthful, HTLV. It causes, these are blood cell cancers, so it's a T-cell lymphocytic leukemia. So this is a cancer specifically of our white blood cells, the T-cells. The human T lymphotrophic virus Two very similar virus. It just changes the cell's shape a little bit where they actually look like they're starting to have extensions coming off of them and they get the nickname of hairy cell leukemia. Again, as these cells are reproducing, they're reproducing so quickly, nothing's telling them to stop. They reproduce and we now have cells that as they're reproducing incorrectly so quickly, they can no longer do their job. How this virus is picked up, it's contaminated fluid. So blood transfusion, contaminated needles, sex, and breast milk can all transmit this particular virus. As of right now, we don't have any treatment. We've got a lot of cancer treatments. We do the best we can, but it's still a virus, and we've got to get rid of the virus. The problem is this virus is attacking the exact cells that are supposed to be removing the virus. So it usually causes a very long-term uh, chronic cancer that, you know, we try to maintain life for as long as we can, but ultimately it is destroying uh, the white blood cells. The other group don't cause cancer, they just go straight to destroying the immune system cells. So they're immunosuppressive retroviruses. And they cause the condition or the syndrome known as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, more commonly known as AIDS. What this means is that you acquire an immune system that becomes deficient. So you weren't born with an immune system that wasn't working, you acquired this immunodeficiency. What that will lead to, uh, it will lead to opportunistic or rare infections that 
Generally, those that have any sort of working immune system, even if it's weak, can fight off. You will show or demonstrate you've got antibodies against HIV. Even though you can make antibodies against HIV, HIV, unfortunately, it's not enough. Uh, and what it does is it starts to destroy our CD4, our T helper cells. And when the counts of those start to get less than 200 per microliter of blood, we now are at the point where if you've got less than 200 of these per microliter, that's not enough of these particular white blood cells that your immune system can do its job properly, that it can alert the other cells, that they can get rid of anything else that gets in the body. The virus that's causing this is the human immunodeficiency virus, more commonly known as HIV. The origin of this virus is the simian immunodeficiency virus. And if you know anything about animals, simians are monkeys. How it went from monkey to humans, we're not all that genetically different. Some po at some point, that virus just slightly changed in interaction between the monkey and human, and now humans have their own human immunodeficiency virus. Now, there are two major types or strains of this particular virus. They do the same thing. It's just more predominant in different parts of the world. So HIV-1 is usually found more in the U.S. and Europe. HIV-2 is found more in West Africa. Now, just looking at the HIV structure becomes important when you're looking at how does it target very specific cells in our immune system. So it does have two strands of single positive sense, single-stranded RNA, so it's got two identical copies. It has that enzyme reverse transcriptase. On the outside of it, so it is enveloped, but the outside it has these two glycoproteins, GP120 and GP41, so GP for glycoprotein. It's these two glycoproteins on the outside that allows it to recognize those T helper cells, attach them, invade them, and ultimately destroy them. If we can somehow change these up or change that docking site on our white blood cells, ultimately we could stop the, white, the virus from infecting those cells. Now this is showing, and I'll include this little video clip on Blackboard, but showing that if once that virus gets in the body, it uses that GP120 and 41 to recognize our CD4 white blood cells. So our CD4 white blood cell have almost like little docking sites. This HIV recognizes it with its proteins. It attaches, it, the entire thing gets engulfed by endocytosis. But because we don't need any of that envelope, it gets rid of it right away. So it uncoats it. And what gets released then is that genetic material, those single-stranded RNA, the red, with that reverse transcriptase. It then undergoes that reverse transcription and out comes our double-stranded DNA. Well, DNA likes to hang out of the nucleus, so that's exactly where this DNA is going to go. It's going to go inside our nucleus of our cells, of our CD4 white blood cells, and it's going to integrate into our cell's DNA. Once it integrates that viral DNA into our DNA, our cells are now virus producing factory. So that when the DNA is read and does normal transcription, normal translation, as it goes through that transcription, it starts to make RNA as it's supposed to, but some of that now becomes viral RNA, not normal RNA that tells our cells to make things that our cells need. That also makes the other parts too. It makes all the proteins that will eventually become part of the coat. So we go through transcription, we start to make the DNA or the RNA, and the, we start to make the proteins. Those parts all get packaged up and get released. But if you notice one unique thing about this particular virus, they don't assemble themselves inside the cells. They assemble themselves after they're released. There's another enzyme that causes these viruses to assemble and actually look like a correct virus. Because of this unique enzyme, this is also where we can target in a lot of our HIV drugs. So that even if our cells are under attack and making all the parts, what they're releasing are viruses that can't infect other cells. 
because they can't assemble. Now the course of AIDS and helper T cell destruction, right away after an initial primary infection, the green is your T white blood cell count, it destroys a lot of our white blood cells. This is usually the first few weeks, the number of viruses skyrockets in the red, and our immune system will start to kick in as well and start to make antibodies. But it's usually within this first one to two months after infection, we start to see signs and symptoms, tired, fatigue, uh, your immune system is waning, you start to develop things like the thrush in your mouth um, and other fungal diseases, you're sick from other things. Again, your immune system is under attack. But what can happen though is as your immune system, it might be under attack, but you do start to develop antibodies and as the antibody count rises, the number of virus in the body does decrease doesn't go away, but it will decrease because your antibody is starting to target them. And what can happen is that once those viruses start to decrease, they're still integrated. The DNA is still part of our cells, but it kind of goes dormant for a really long time and you enter in what's known as clinical latency. And now we jump to not weeks, but years that the antibodies themselves, we continue to make antibodies but after a while, those antibodies will go away. The white blood cells will start to rebound a little bit, but ultimately during those years, they're eventually gonna slowly start to go away. And the number of viruses will slowly start to go up. And that's again, is because your antibodies start to go down. So the thing that's trying to attack them starts to go away, so slowly they do start to go up. And it's once you get that low knife white blood cell count, the less than 200 per microliter, this is when you start to see those opportunistic diseases that will lead to death, is that you start to get things that make you sick, that kill you, that other people that have any sort of working immune system don't get. A couple diseases associated with AIDS, this is a disseminated herpes. That means it spreads all throughout the body. Nothing in the body can keep it in check. So there's skin lesions everywhere. There's a cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. It is a viral cancer, but it only affects those that have no working immune systems, so those in the AIDS stage of HIV infection. And it is a cancer of the blood vessels. And so it literally causes bursting blood vessels all over the body. Now, epidemiology, how it spread. Oops, I go back. Uh, in the U.S., the predominant group that spreads this particular virus is our young male homosexuals. This virus wasn't really predominant until the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then we really started to see a lot more cases. And truly, it is worldwide. Every continent, every country has got HIV. The fluids that it's found in, it is most infectious in semen and in blood. And because those two infection sites, because it is so concentrated, meaning it's most infectious um, in semen, so most infectious, I'll list other ones, uh, semen and blood, uh, those make male that top group, but then anyone that shares needles are going to be another big group because of that high concentration in blood. But you can find HIV viruses themselves in just about every bodily fluid. We can find it in breast milk, and breast milk can be infectious. Uh, we can find it in fecal matter. We can find it in urine. We can find it in saliva. I mean, we can find the viruses in our body in lots of different fluids. The biggest difference is it's in such a low number that we generally don't meet in infectious dose. For example, although there can be some HIV viruses in saliva, you would have to consume, you would have to drink a gallon of infected saliva to meet the infectious dose. And because that's not something I would hope ever happens, saliva is not considered an infectious material. This is just showing global prevalence that yes, it's around. Um, we've got cases here in the United States, just looking straight numbers. This is looking percent wise. Some of the highest cases though, Southern Africa, uh, here in Wisconsin, 5.3 cases for every 100,000 people. So even just thinking, 
if we combined, say, all the people that live in La Crosse and Holman, and maybe throw in with Salem, it's that's a region probably right around 100,000. I mean, there's going to be at least five people infected. So it's around number-wise. Again, the groups that are usually spreading it, male-to-male -male sexual contact because of that high concentration in semen seems to be the biggest group of HIV infection. Otherwise, heterosexual contact with females, um, heterosexual contact with males, and then we start getting into the drug use. Now, in determining if someone's in the age stage of HIV infection, the symptoms can vary. Again, this is looking, this is an example of that thrush. It's a fungal disease if you're immunocompromised. But the symptoms, it, you're picking up usually some type of opportunistic disease, and it, it depends on what you picked up, how much were you exposed to it, uh, where's your immune system at. The biggest way we generally say someone's in the age states of HIV infection is that low CD4 white blood cell count. So do they have less than 200 per microliter, as well as determining the presence of antibodies against HIV. Testing. We again can look for the antibodies. My note though, it does happen though that sometimes people have been exposed to this virus, but not at an infectious dose level. But if you've been exposed to something, even if not at an infectious dose, that may trigger your immune system to make antibodies. It's not uncommon, I mean it's not super common, but it's not uncommon for people to test positive for HIV antibodies, but they don't have HIV. It just means somewhere, somehow they were exposed to the virus and they made a very low dose of these antibodies. If that happens, they're not going to rely strictly on that test. They always do a confirmatory test, a PCR test that's looking specifically for the viral RNA. The only way the viral RNA is there is if the virus itself is there. That would confirm a diagnosis. So signs and symptoms completely vary among individuals. And there are a few random people that don't develop AIDS that for whatever reason their immune system seems to be able to keep it in check. Now, this is not something that's like, oh, well, I'm sure I'm one of those. I think there's two cases in the whole world that this has happened. They're over in Europe, and luckily they've been very fortunate and volunteered to work with the medical facility and to be like, yes, please figure out what kind of genetics do I have that allows me to be immune. Treatment. They consider treatment for AIDS an ART, which is an antiretroviral therapy generally means you're given at least two kinds of drugs, two kinds of antiviral drugs found from at least three different antiviral drug classes. Again, we've got different types of drug classes depending on what they are targeting and how they work. Pretty much you're taking a lot of drugs. We're very fortunate in this day and age, we've put a lot of money into HIV research and we have a lot of outcome from that. So some of the drugs that we have, we're targeting some of those enzymes. We're targeting the, the reverse transcriptase enzyme. We're targeting the protease enzyme that causes it to assemble once released. We're targeting how can we just stop it from being released from the cells altogether. That some of the drugs we have on the market now can almost make it undetectable in your bloodstream. That's not to say that the virus isn't still uptaken in your white blood cells. It integrates, that, that DNA that it made integrates into our white blood cell, but the virus is no longer releasing from our white blood cells. We do have drugs that are slowing or stopping that release from the white blood cells, which means then it's no longer infectious because you don't have the virus itself that's leaving. Again, it's still part of you, it's not gone, but you, we've got lots of drugs that are stopping the infection. So our numbers of cases luckily are, really, are going down with all of these new drugs on the market. So our best bet is just, just let's not get HIV. So prevention, behavioral changes are the best way. You know, monogamy, using condoms, and then if you think you've been exposed, getting tested and getting on treatments right away so that you are not infectious. Now onto our last group. I drew all these little lines on here. So we're dividing. We're finally onto our negative sense, single-stranded RNA. Now, both of these 
are enveloped. The biggest difference is that these viruses in the red, their RNA is segmented, so they get multiple copies, whereas this is one long strand. So all enveloped. And we've got in this group that they're all one strand, three groups of them, paramyxoviridae, rabdoviridae, and filoviridae. The paramyxoviridae group is larger. What these all four groups of viruses have in common is that they make a syncytia, which means infected cells will fuse together. So as viruses get inside of these cells, it causes the cells to fuse together which allow viruses to really travel freely from one fused cell to another. They have this like one massive cell. It's a great breeding ground for making lots of new viruses. The four viruses in this group that we'll talk about, which will be my next slides, the measles, parainfluenza, mumps, and pneumovirus, more commonly known as the respiratory syncytial virus. And then there's also in our grouping of unsegmented, so one long strand, of negative sense single-stranded RNAs, the rabdoviridae, and the filoviridae. So our first virus is measles. It is spread respiratory droplets in large, dense populations. So when you get a lot of people together, coughing, talking, sneezing, it spreads. It gets into the respiratory tract, affects the respiratory tract first before it then spreads throughout the rest of the body. One of uh, the unique characteristics that can actually be used in diagnosing measles, because they can cause a lot of your normal viral, you know, viral signs and symptoms, fever, fatigue, tired, body aches. But if you pulled back your gums, inside your gums, you have these white spots that have some kind of red irritation behind them. Those are coplic spots, and that's a very unique outward sign that this particular virus shows. Now, most individuals that get measles, you suffer. You've got a widespread rash, fever, fatigued, tired. Your body's fighting something, but most individuals do recover without any long-lasting permanent damage. However, there are rare complications. This is usually about two to three cases in every thousand cases is it can develop into pneumonia, encephalitis, and what's known as subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So we've got inflammation of the brain tissue that then can be deadly. Again, usually most do recover on their own, but again, two to three people in every thousand cases that can be hospitalized and or die of this, we've got a vaccine that can just prevent it altogether. So diagnosing it, we do have antibody tests, we do have RNA, we're looking for that genetic material test. Otherwise, just using those coplic spots, that's a very unique outward sign. Treatment, it's mostly just supportive. We don't have a lot of antivirals. We do know um, high levels of vitamin B seem to decrease the signs and symptoms if taken right away, but it's mostly just outward. If you've got a fever, take anti fever meds, um, and generally recover on your own. Again, prevention. We've got a vaccine that works really, really well. As soon as that vaccine came out, the number of cases just plummeted almost to the point where we eradicated measles because so many people got vaccinated. It was almost unheard of for people to get measles. Now, as the vaccine numbers are going down and we have large groups of individuals that all live close in close contact that aren't vaccinated, we're starting to see the cases rise. Uh, 2014, we had a really big outbreak, and it went back to this picture in Disneyland in California. Large, dense populations, and people come from all over the world to go to Disneyland and even to Disney World which means you can have a lot of people not vaccinated, all possibly spreading it. And I believe there were like 800 cases total uh, of individuals that got measles from going to Disneyland. We've also had lots of other outbreaks as well. Again, the measles vaccination rates are decreasing, which leads to then outbreaks. 2018, we had another big measles outbreak here in the United States that we were just seeing cases spread all over. It was getting to the point they were even starting to, you know, ban individuals from going to public areas. 
it's like, oh, that kind of sounds a little bit like COVID. And this is pre-COVID. It's kind of like if you haven't been vaccinated, you need to isolate because there were so many cases in some counties. Our second of our viruses in this paramyxoviridae group that make the syncytia is the parrot influenza virus. It's usually most common in children and infants. It's transmitted respiratory droplets. There are four strains, HPIV 1, 2, and 3, and then HPIV 4. 1, 2, and 3 all affect the upper respiratory tract. The HPIV 4 again, human para-influenza virus, it's a mouthful, affects the lower respiratory tract. They're all affecting the respiratory tract and it's spread respiratory drop, or respiratory droplets. HPIV1 and 2, because they're affecting that respiratory system and they cause inflammation in the larynx, trachea, and the bronchi, the cough that, sound, that comes out it has a very distinct sound. They say it sounds like a seal bark cough. So if you've ever been to a zoo or somewhere where there's seals laying on a beach, they kind of have a really loud bark when they talk at each other. And that's really because of this inflammation of this airway that causes that unique sounding cough. We have no treatment for this. Luckily, most people recover without any long lasting uh, issues. It's mostly really big inconvenient because you've got a very chronic cough, tired, fevered, fatigue, all those signs and that signs that your immune system's attacking something. The third virus is our mumps. It's also transmitted respiratory droplets, usually close contact. It affects the upper respiratory system, but it can spread to other organs in the body. One of the places that it really likes to infect is it likes to affect the parotid salivary gland found in the cheek area. That big salivary gland that's found there causes inflammation. So it almost looks like you just got your wisdom teeth pulled out. You look all puffy, but sometimes it usually only happens on one side, which would be unique versus getting your wisdom teeth pulled out. Other symptoms that I can have, again, you're you can it can, can develop into more serious complications like meningitis, pancreatitis, and deafness in one ear, and part is that that swelling that can cause permanent damage in the earway. It can be asymptomatic for others, which then becomes the issue because individuals that are asymptomatic could potentially be spreading it, and then they have no idea. Otherwise, fever fatigue is your big things that your immune system is fighting something off. We don't have any specific antiviral treatments for this particular virus, but we do have a vaccine to prevent it. It's part of the measles, mumps, and rubella. Now, the mumps vaccine is somewhere between 80 and 85 percent effective. And you're like, well, that's not great. It's not 100 percent. And we know this. We know some people's immune systems don't see it, don't recognize it, don't make the antibodies to have the full immune system response. The idea is if enough people get vaccinated, even if you were in that unlucky 20%, if everyone you interact with are all vaccinated and it worked for them, if no one exposes you to mumps, it doesn't matter if your vaccine didn't work, you're not going to get it. So the idea is if we get enough people vaccinated, it's going to stop the transmission sequence. The fourth of our last of our paramyxoviridae group is the respiratory syncytial virus, also known as the pneumovirus, that affects the lower respiratory tract. And this can cause a fatal a, a, a fatal respiratory disease in infants and young children. Older children and adults may be asymptomatic or have a mild cough, which means they again think, I just have a minor cough, but they could be spreading it to infants, and that can be extremely deadly. So it's spread by the respiratory droplets, and it again is in that group that forms this this syncytia, these fused cells in our lungs. And if you fuse all the cells in your lungs, you no longer can get oxygen exchange that's necessary for survival. So it causes dyspnea or difficulty breathing, 
And we do have really quick diagnosis, just kind of like our COVID tests and our strep tests. We can test for the respiratory syncytial virus. Treatment is supportive. Now, we're fortunate again just within the last few years that we now do have a respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. And so they are now promoting it to high-risk groups, to infants, elderly even, that may suffer more unique, you know, more complications uh, of getting vaccinated against this virus. I'm going to say, so this just came out, 2023, new Pfizer vaccine. The next virus in this group is the Rhabdoviridae group unique and I really like this virus because it's very unique. It causes disease known as rabies and then we'll get to the filoviridae which are not fun. So the rabies virus is a zoonotic disease meaning we pick it up by interacting with animals. So it's not a respiratory thing that someone coughs on you or sneezes on you. We pick it up by the bite of an infected animal because when that virus is in the animal the virus concentrates itself in the salivary glands. And then when an animal bites you, that saliva now is in an open wound and there's your transmission sequence. The virus also has a unique looking capsid that looks like a bullet. So it's just a unique shaped virus as well. Now, once that virus gets into the body, it attacks the nervous system and you start to develop neurological symptoms. Now, this is usually these are within a few months after exposure. Some of the first symptoms is you may start to kind of feel dizzy. You might have, you know, irritation, irritability, um, just things that, you know, something's going on in your body and you just don't really know why. You might have some twitching because it's affecting the nervous system. Uh, again, depending on where it is attacking first kind of depends on some of the symptoms. But eventually it can lead to things known as hydrophobia, which the word means a fear of water. And it's not that you're afraid of water, but animals do stop drinking when they get to this stage. If you may develop seizures, disorientation, hallucinations, paralysis, and then eventually it will cause death. It's not a, oh, it might, or you've got a chance, or if you're untreated, it will cause death. By the time you have any type of outward symptoms, it's 99.99999% that you will die of it. So this is not one you just, well, I'll wait to see what happens and then go get treated. By the time you wait to see what happens, you, there's nothing else they can do for you. Now, the predominant wildlife reservoir for rabies in our area is the skunk, but that's generally not the animal we're more concerned about because I'm guessing most of you don't have a lot of interaction and aren't getting bitten by skunks because you're not handling them. And so even though a lot of these animals are infected, the infection sequence from those is lower. For us, we're the, the, in kind of the infectious area that seems to affect us, dogs and bats, because these are animals that can bite you. These are animals that can bite in another infected animal and then bite you. I'm like, my, my dog used to love chasing skunks. Thanks. And if she would have caught it, I have no doubt she would have bitten it, which means then she could be harboring it and then just even playful biting, playing around, she now becomes an infection site. Now, we don't see a lot of cases of rabies, and when we do, that's when it usually makes the news. So last year, they were looking, because Maine was having a lot more animals than normal, that were testing positive for rabies and so it became an issue of making sure that people knew you know on you know not interacting with wildlife making sure you stay away from them and then if you have had some type of interaction with wildlife because you know a raccoon got in someone's house uh, that you know go ahead and get treated as fast as possible so diagnose something someone with rabies well they usually look at neurological symptoms and Again, by the time you have symptoms, there isn't anything they can do. 
They can look at negra bodies or infected death of cells in your nervous tissue, and this is done post-mortem. So you're diagnosing, by the time you're diagnosing and saying you have it, it's too late. So your best bet is to treat before you get signs and symptoms because that's when it is treatable. So at the site of infection, they are going to want you to clean that infection site to try to get as many of the viruses out of that infection site as possible. Then they're going to give you antibodies. So they're going to give you that passive vaccine. They're going to give you antibodies to try to bind up the virus. And then they're going to vaccinate you. We're fortunate that even though this is a very deadly virus, it works really slow. Sometimes you don't even see signs or symptoms for months. There's documented cases of years even, which is rare, but it can. it's a very slow virus. Because it's such a slow virus, our immune system works faster than the virus. So this is one of those few things that we can actually vaccinate after exposure. Usually you have to get vaccinated before exposure. You can't get the flu and then be like, oh, I'd like to get vaccinated now. Um, it doesn't work that way. But for this one, it does. Now, we generally don't go around and vaccinate everyone for rabies unless they have been exposed to it. But the group of individuals that we do vaccinate are our dogs. And again, if they're one of those big transmission sequences as dog bite other animals interacting with them and then they bite even playfully with us, they become an infection source. And so we do vaccinate our pets against rabies. And then the last group in this you know, unsegmented negative sense single-stranded RNA are the filoviridae group. And why they're called filoviridae group, they are very long and skinny, and they say that it looks filamentous. So it looks like a big, long, skinny filament. And it's the Marburg and Ebola viruses. We're unsure of where these viruses originated from because they haven't been around forever. They are spread by contaminated bodily fluids and syringes. They can be spread through respiratory droplets, but you do have to be in close contact. And this, this particular, or these two viruses both target the liver. And they destroy the liver. And because so much blood goes through the liver getting filtered, when it destroys it, and when I say destroys, the liver is a pile of goo. It causes uncontrolled bleeding internally, which then can present itself outwardly. So symptoms are used for diagnosing. It does start off with your basic flu-like type symptoms, fever, fatigue, um, and diagnosing it. Treatment, fluid replacement, and we are genetically engineering antibodies. So we're not giving people or even animals Marburg or Ebola and hoping they can make antibodies that we can then put in someone else. We're genetically engineering antibodies in labs, and they're called ZMAP antibodies. And they're showing some really good promise. Otherwise, Marburg and Ebola had a pretty high death rate. We're fortunate because uh, here in the United States, we don't have cases of Marburg and Ebola. Although I should say, I'm like, sometimes we do see some cases, but it's all individuals that have traveled to endemic areas that have the virus. Most of the cases of Ebola and Marburg are found in Africa. The highest number of cases are over on the western uh, coast. Um, I was going to say another outbreak was happening in Africa of Marburg. In 2024 or 2023, Uganda was having another Ebola outbreak. Again, Africa seems to be where these viruses are uh, most endemic. And then on to our next group, our last kind of big group here, are our enveloped but segmented negative sense single-stranded RNA. And we've got three groups in here. We're going to start with the first one, which is probably the one you might be most familiar with, the orthomyxiviridae group, which is that orthomyxivirus or the flu virus. We also have a bunyaviridae and a renoviridae. A lot of these infect animals and then are transmitted to humans, but not all of them. We'll talk about ones that aren't. Uh, but I always like to think, well, bunya sounds like the word bunny, so I think animals. But some are not spread via animals. So again, we'll talk about some that aren't and some that are. 
So the first, that orthomyxoviridae group, there are two orthomyxoviruses, type A and type B. So if you do go, go in and get tested for the flu, they might say you've got flu type A or you've got influenza A or influenza B because there are two different strains. They are picked up through inhalation and these viruses are going to attack and destroy the epithelial lining of our lung cells. This becomes an issue because you are constantly breathing stuff in all the time. And so our first line of defense is that epithelial lining so that you don't get infected with everything you breathe in all day long. But these viruses attack that epithelial lining, removing our first line of defense, which means you are more likely once you get the flu to pick, a second, pick up a secondary bacterial infection. Now, the symptoms of the flu, fever, malaise, headache, and myalgia, which is muscle pain. Now, the thing that people usually associate with the flu is vomiting, and that is not an influenza at all. That is not a flu symptom. People call things, oh, it's a stomach flu, but I don't know why they even use the word flu. It's a stomach bug is more likely. The flu does not cause vomiting. However, if you do actually test positive for influenza and you're vomiting, it's because you picked up something else. It's super common that people that do get influenza, they do pick up something else. And it's also one of the reasons why when elderly immunocompromised people go to the doctor's office, test positive for the flu, they walk out of the doctor's office with an antibiotic. And it's not because the antibiotic is going to do anything for the flu. It's because they are more likely to pick up some type of secondary bacterial infection. And if you're immunocompromised, that can cause even more severe complications. So an antibiotic is routinely given to some uh, immunocompromised elderly ind individuals when they test positive for the flu. Again, but that's hard to explain to a patient of these antibiotics are going to do nothing for the flu. It's to prevent you from picking up other bacterial infections. The cytokines, these are the chemicals that your body is producing when infected that's causing you to have all these outward signs and symptoms. Now, the influenza virus itself, it again, kind of like HIV, it's helpful to understand the structure of it. So this group, it, they're segmented. So it has RNA in eight segments. So all of its RNA is made up of eight segments of RNA. It also has two glycoproteins on the outside, the neuraminidase and hemagglutinin, and NAs and HAs. Again, if we're looking at all of the green are HIs and all the blues are NAs, we notice that it's like, oh, well, there's almost looks to be kind of a pattern of like three to one, but it's not an exact pattern of three to one. And this is what's happening with the flu virus is that as just even the slightest little bit of genetic change, one A change to a C, you know, I'm like just a slight genetic change, the NAs and the HAs shift around. And we're instead of three to one, maybe this is now two to one. Maybe it's three to one, two, one, four, one. Um, it's a highly variable genome. And every time there's a slight change in inwardly on the genetics, there's a slight change outwardly on these glycoproteins. And the problem is every slight change in glycoproteins means it's a slightly different flu virus. As viruses are constantly just slightly changing, this is known as antigenic drift. And I like to think it's like, well, they're kind of just bouncing along, just drifting along, slightly changing just ever so much. But this is why we get flu vaccines every year. Not because your immune system is waning. It's because every year the genetics is changing, the glycoproteins are slightly changing, and what was in the vaccine last year isn't effective against the new strains this year. So we keep getting new flu vaccines to hopefully arm ourselves against all the new strains that look like they're showing up. So the CDC is constantly tracking, well, what are they doing? Are we getting more NAs? Are we getting more HAs? Uh, what are the strains that we see prevalent? And then they make vaccines that try to include all of those. Some years they're a little more accurate than others. 
Now, antigenic shift. So this is antigenic drift. That's one way we can get a lot of new flu viruses. Another way we can get new flu viruses is known as antigenic shift. So they look and sound very much alike, but they are different. So antigenic drift, drifting along, slightly changing, why we need a new flu vaccine. Antigenic shift is when you take the RNA, so the genetic material, the genome, from two different viruses, so influenza A plus some other virus, and you shuffle them up and recombine them to make a brand new virus. So that's what this is showing is antigenic shift. Two different strains of viruses, they both go into the cells together, they shuffle up all their genetics, and then what comes out, because we like to mix red and blue make purple, is now a completely new virus. And this is what happens when we start to get things like bird flu, is that we can take an influenza strain that affects humans, and if in the same cell as another virus that infects another animal, which normally wouldn't cause us issues, but if you mix the two together, now you have a flu strain that it can infect humans, but it still has the genetics of, say, that other animal, and it can cause some severe complications. So antigenic shift, teal goes in, blue comes out. It's like a slight difference. Antigenic shift, completely recombining. What's interesting, though, is antigenic shift, we seem to kind of get outbreaks of these new viruses about every 10 years. In 2020, it was kind of when we were due for all these new strains. Um, COVID is not in the flu strain, but it kind of seemed like we were expecting a big outbreak in 2020. Otherwise, we look at back at the swine flu outbreak, the bird flu outbreak, is again, it's about every 10 years. So here's just showing how we can take some type of bird and human influenza, recombine them, even if it's another animal, and then we get some completely new strain that infects humans, but it still has some genetics from another strain of virus. Again, I was going to say bird flus is affecting a lot of birds, um, and it's then a concern for us if it's going to cause us issues, and there's lots of strains of bird flus. Lots of strains. They all get fancy names like H1, N1, and things like that. Um, but or H3, N8. Um, lots of different strains. So we get really concerned for people that work with poultry that may possibly pick up a bird flu because now technically that might be a brand new strain of virus that infects them and it's because of that constant interaction. Get big big outbreak in 2023. Uh, diagnosing signs and symptoms. We do have tests, super fast tests that will test us positive for influence A, influence B. We do have things like Tamiflu over the counter, or this known as Tamiflu kind of over the counter. The drug's name is Oseltamivir or Zanimivir. Um, if given within the first 48 hours, the symptoms can decrease how long you have the virus. Otherwise, prevention preventing, we can get rid of infected birds, which again raises the prices of eggs as we're killing lots of birds and chickens. And otherwise, we're getting vaccines, multivalent, which means these vaccines are against lots of different strains. Even if it, and it's one of those like, well, I got the flu vaccine and now I got the flu. It's true. Maybe you, unfortunately, either one didn't respond to the vaccine or you got the vaccine and you got a different strain that that vaccine didn't protect against. But it's interesting because a lot of people will say, well, I got the vaccine and then I got the flu from the vaccine. Genetically, that's not correct. Like there's scientifically, you can't get the flu by getting the vaccine. However, as we've talked before, is when you do get a vaccine, it's not uncommon that you might be tired and achy and even have a slight fever. That's your immune system working, and uh, that's expected. But that's not going to be at all as severe as what the actual flu is, and you're not damaging the lung tissues. It's also possible that someone went and got the flu vaccine, but also, as we've talked about when we talked about the immune system, it can take two weeks before we start to have a full antibody response to the vaccine. 
And it's not uncommon that depending when you went and got the flu vaccine, maybe you went and got the flu vaccine, you know, December 1st, but then December 2nd, you were hanging out with some friends and someone coughed on you and you picked up the virus. Just because you got the flu vaccine, say December 1st, doesn't mean you can't still get the flu by being exposed December 2nd because you don't have antibody response yet. It's not an immediate protection. The bunny viruses are in this group. They also are a zoonotic pathogen. Again, they sound like bunny. Uh, but it's not by picked up by strictly interacting with the animals. It's insects, arthropods, can bite some of these animals and bite us. Most of the symptoms are mild, usually affecting either respiratory systems, um, might cause slight fevers, it might cause encephalitis. Now the interesting part is some examples, I put California encephalitis and La Crosse encephalitis. Let's see if I've got, oh, I don't have a picture, uh, is there is a bunya virus that causes the disease known as La Crosse encephalitis. And that does mean La Crosse is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So La Crosse is in textbooks because we've got our own virus, our own disease named after it. And it's because there was a boy that had picked it up and died of it. And we hadn't actually identified the virus yet. So they eventually identified the virus. And because he was from La Crosse, it got named La Crosse encephalitis. Fortunately for us, um, although it's named lacrosse, and there are cases around here, most prevalent cases are more in southeastern type states. If we're going to Tennessee, Kentucky, the Carolinas is really where you're seeing a lot of lacrosse encephalitis um, spread by insects. It causes mostly fever, but it can cause more severe complications like encephalitis, which then can be deadly. Hantavirus is a virus that's still in the bunya virus group and it is spread via animals usually by mice so urine and feces can actually harbor this virus and if inhaled because you've got fecal and urine matter around you can develop the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome which can put you know bad enough it can cause respiratory distress Again, difficulty breathing, you're probably going to end up in the hospital, probably on oxygen. And then we have our arena viruses. We have a hemp that causes um, hemorrhagic fevers, uh, usually found in rodents, so mice, rats, in Africa, South America. can also cause severe bleeding internally. There's also a lymphocytic choreomeningitis. It's mouthful. Um, so some arenavirus strains. There's a lot of strains of arenaviruses. Uh, it can cause typically, usually flu-like symptoms. It can be spread aerosols and contaminated food. And again, it usually causes flu-like symptoms, but it can cause meningitis and um, enlarged lymph nodes. There's also a, another arena virus strain called the Lassa fever virus that is spread by bodily fluids that causes more flu-like symptoms, fever, body aches, chills, um, usually nothing too severe. One other unique virus that's in the arena virus group, it's not spread by insects, it's not spread by animals, so it's not, not a zoonotic virus is the hepatitis D virus. It spreads strictly by bodily fluids, most likely sexual contact and contaminated needles. But the interesting part about hepatitis D is that it cannot reproduce. It cannot replicate by itself when it gets inside of host cells. It actually requires the mechanics of hepatitis B. So if an individual has hepatitis B, and then picks up hepatitis D, then it causes much more severe complications with liver. It can cause severe liver damage, a chronic damage, which then puts you at an increased risk for liver cancer and as well as liver failure. What's nice is although we don't have a vaccine against hepatitis D, we do have a vaccine against hepatitis B. And if you can prevent yourself from getting hepatitis B, that ultimately prevents yourself from getting hepatitis D as well. So one vaccine vaccinates against two things. And then our final RNA virus at the very top are the real viruses. 
They're also known as the rotaviruses, and there's just one. And the unique thing about them is that they have double-stranded RNA. It's just one single little group here. It's very unique. RNA, single-stranded. Everything else up here, whether it's the positive strand or the negative strand, is all single-stranded RNA. So one little group has a unique, though, is it's double-stranded RNA. Again, it's the rheoviruses, more commonly known as the rotaviruses. It causes infantile gastroenteritis, aka really bad diarrhea. And depending on where you live, it is a top cause of deaths in developing countries. Diarrhea causes a top cause of death, but this particular virus can lead to that. It's transmitted fecal-oral, and again, kids can be dirty. It generally goes away on its own. It leaves with the diarrhea. Treatment is just replacing fluids and electrolytes. Your best way to prevent it is good hygiene because it's spread fecal oral and making sure there's adequate sewage treatment. Now here in the United States, we do have good sewage treatment. However, kids don't have the best hygiene. And before the vaccine was developed and is very commonly given, uh, it was a 100% chance that kids picked up rotavirus uh, before they hit the age of two. It's just, I mean, diapers and daycares was like a 100% chance your kids are going to get diarrhea, lots of different reasons, but by this particular virus. Now we have a vaccine very commonly given, and again, it decreases one more thing that can cause your child to have diarrhea. So we've made it through all of these RNA viruses. I know there's a lot of them, so when reviewing and studying, really focus on what are the unique characteristics about them.